my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you. May we know that it's okay to laugh, to, to cry, to, to feel what we know in ourselves, to not be alone in it. For it's in all these things we pray as you give us comfort and strength. Amen. So every story has a villain. Every story has a hero or a shero, uh, maybe multiple uh, antagonists or protagonists. In the story Frozen, the villain just happens to be a misfortunate prince by the name of Hans. Hans Westergaard is the prince of the Southern Isles. He's the youngest of 13 sons. He was neglected by his brothers who pretend that he was invisible for at least a couple of years. Well, what, you know, sibling hasn't done that to us in the first place. He's raised, though, without love. And all of this, as a result, as he grew up, leads him to be a manipulative type person who's obsessed with obtaining power for himself. This plan is somehow to, to overcome the kingdom of Arendelle that he might be king. Well, later on the story here, uh, he attempts to kill Princess Anna, who's the younger of the two sisters, as well as he tries to kill off Queen Elsa. Hans begins to fulfill his plot when the opportunity comes as he begins to court Princess Anna. They seem to have everything in common with each other. It's almost too good to be true. Even to the extent of of finishing each other's sandwiches. Actually, it's finishing each other's sentences. You've known those type of friendships and relationships where you seem to end each other's phrases and thoughts. Well, they sing a song, and instead of saying sentences, they say sandwiches. They're Twitter-pated by love, or at least, uh, you know, Anna is. She falls in her in love, head over heels, and eventually comes to realize that she's been, you know, deceived by this sandwich stealing suitor of hers. Now I like to eat. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? And often it gets the best of me. And then I get it under control and all is well. And then the next holiday comes or the next you know, unpredictable emotional need presents itself. Has anybody got some chips right now? But besides eating, I also like to cook. They seem to go hand in hand with each other. I love to grill a steak. I, I like making, you know, jalapeno deviled eggs. Uh, my latest thing here is making refried beans in an Instapot. It takes no lard or fat, just nice chicken stock. I love making my air fryer teriyaki and sriracha chicken wings. Better than the restaurant. My joy of cooking seems to have kind of spawned up in my early years when I was young. And it involved rather a simple recipe. A couple slices of bread, a dab of peanut butter, and a glob of jelly. The peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Y'all know how to make that? You can follow me, and I've got a whole host of recipes. I got the phone number for the best pizza in town if you, if you want that recipe, too. It was a four-star meal unto itself, but yet my next step up became the peanut butter and honey sandwich. Yum. You know, though, however, I came to understand and I began to discover that beyond the home, not everybody eats the entire sandwich. Did you know this phenomenon? A lot of people, when I was a kid, they don't eat the crust. You know the brown edge that's around the bread there? They would eat everything around that and leave the, you know, the bread bones right there next to their plate. And then I'd come along there and, and I would take those seconds and, and enjoy them. That's how I discovered the, the peanut butter and honey concoction. It was pretty good. But we all finish each other's sandwiches in many different ways. Maybe we give those extras to others or we allow them to, to snake it from our plate. Maybe we take those extras for ourselves or we toss the leftovers away. Maybe we save those leftovers from uh, maybe a, a later time snack. But why don't we just consider in the first place of, of giving them the, way, uh, the whole sandwich to start? Why don't we wait to give away the pieces of those undesirable seconds? You know, there's a lot to take in when you have 
have that whole sandwich there in front of you. And maybe we should make a, an extra sandwich when we're making one for ourselves. That's solving a situation. Or maybe we can begin by offering up what we started with in the first place. All of this itself makes for one great feast. Now this morning's text that uh, Don read for us, it has nothing to do with sandwiches, does it? But it has everything to do with this, uh, basically this whole notion of sloppy seconds. This morning's passage is an allegorical story about a vineyard, the owner of the vineyard, and how to respect other people. Well, the story goes, we heard it. The vineyard is planted. A fence is placed around the vineyard, probably to protect it from animals coming in and you know, eating what's inside the vineyard. A watchtower is placed near the vineyard. And, you know, maybe this is to kind of protect the area itself or to keep an eye on the whole land as, as the vineyard begins to grow. Maybe it's a place where the tenants would live that are watching the vineyard and managing it. And then the owner sends, uh, leaves the, the country, goes off and does you know, its own thing. But the time comes to collect some money, to collect the rent from the tenants who are at the vineyard. Collectors are sent. Some are beaten and some are killed by the renters. The owner sends his own son to collect the rent, maybe out of the whole idea, well, maybe they'll respect him, you know, my own kid. He too is beaten and killed. The owner comes and does away with the renters of the vineyard and he gives it over to others. Now, the religious officials of Jesus' day realize that this story is about them. <coughs> Jesus was telling a parable almost like to hold up a mirror to them and to say, this is how you all are. This is how you treat people. They got upset. They wanted to have Jesus arrested, and uh, they go away probably to come up with some sort of scheme to get Jesus arrested. Is there a moral to this story? Well, maybe it's this. The owner offers up the first things. Everything that's before them. The, the collectors, the landowner's son, who easily could be interpreted as Jesus in the story. The tenants and the, the poor leftovers are, are there because they don't give really what's ultimately the first thing that's presented to them. They are the crust of the sandwich that they have partaken in. Therefore, to finish their sandwiches is to partake in the leftovers of the seconds to that are basically second or none to all. Now we might ask, well, then what are the first? How do we connect to this uh, message this morning that really more or less is a meditation and a sermon for us? Well, to experience the unfreezing of our faith during the season of Lent, we come to realize we are called to give our first. Our first, our best, our first includes integrity. Our first includes respect for others. It includes sincerity and honesty. This allegory of the vineyard is, is like the metaphor of finishing sandwiches. Jesus had come to Jerusalem. This was coming to the end of his ministry. He'd been out preaching and teaching the people, performing miracles. Now he was going to Jerusalem. He'd been talking about that to his disciples. And here he is. He enters the temple where he's less than greeted by the religious leaders. They go as far to say, by what authority are you doing what you're doing? Who do you think you are? Jesus doesn't say, by what authority? Jesus does what Jesus does best. He tells a story. He tells a story about plenty, about providing, and about rejection. But two rights don't make a wrong. Two rights mark that we will give our all. There is always enough. We might as well say that too much is given, too much is expected. We've heard this before. The vineyard then perhaps is the church in which we are responsible for not just the building and the resources and everything around it. We are responsible for the very body. We're responsible to each other. 
Now this is what I wrote at five o'clock this morning. I don't know what we're gonna do over the next few weeks or what to expect. It's kind of a fog, I think, for many of us. But together, we're called to remain strong. We're called to remain available to each other and to know that no one will go without. The rush on toilet paper and water and other food items goes to show to, to us that we now have a lot to offer to each other. I can't imagine needing so much toilet paper in a month, let alone in a year's time. The lack of civility seen this week is disheartening and by far an epidemic of its own. But we know the cure. The cure in this case is love and care for each other. It's about peace. It's about some sense of harmony among the people. It's about welcoming the landowner's son and daughters among us and, and beyond us, for we too are the daughters and sons of the landowner. We are the children of the divine. The story of the vineyard calls us to, to welcome the child of the landowner with as much joy and with the reminder that we are called to be one with Christ, one with each other, and one with the world. This parable is a funny one in, in that the human nature looks to the renter who is to fulfill their obligation. When ultimately the gift of the obligation falls from the landowner in the first place, who's providing life from the vineyard. It's been written that the vineyard is ripe, the harvest is plentiful, there is much for everyone. What we bring to community is an example and a means, not to hold back not to live beyond the seconds and to just get the drags, but to always celebrate in the first and honor that with our all and with the whole sandwich. This we eat together and this we share in all that is before us. Thanks be to God. Amen to all of us.